Well, as you can see, you've got a new sticker on the door today. Now, this came to me from My Fit Boy. Now, if you have any interest at all in metal casting or home foundry work, you will have almost certainly come across his channel before. And the best way I can describe My Fit Boy is prolific. <laughs> he has literally hundreds of videos on those topics, but also model engineering, which is another interest that I share. And if you're just getting started in the hobby, it's an excellent resource. And uh, the thing about Myford Boy is he likes to remain anonymous. And in fact, in one of his videos, he referred to himself as the Stig of the metal casting world. Now, if you don't know who the Stig is, you need to watch some of the reruns of the old BBC series Top Gear. And when Myford Boy contacted me, he also sent me his business card. So I've actually got his name, his address, and all sorts of details about him. So today I can reveal to you... Sorry. Hello? Yeah, look mate, I'm trying to do a video here and... Yes? Right. Okay, and you're the lawyer for who? Wait a minute, are you watching me? Right, no. Okay, and just run that by me again. What's a cease and desist order? Really? And punishable by how many years? That is a lot. Yeah, but look, the thing is, you don't understand. I was only... I know, but I was only going... Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Right, thank you. Goodbye. Right, block that number. All right, so um, what am I going to talk about now? Um... Bloody lawyers. In the, uh, the last episode, I showed you how I silver soldered this uh, curved flange to the copper tube and I've got all that cleaned up but what I need to do now is drill a pattern of six holes around that curved flange there. Now uh, it's sort of it's an awkward part and because that's copper it's very soft and it would crush if I gripped that directly in this three jaw chuck. I showed this uh, chuck plate adapter on my last or on my Instagram actually and I cast this plate at home and it takes the three jaw chuck which has got front mounting and I can set that up on the table of the CNC mill and it's great for holding round parts and I put this uh, aluminium slug inside the cop tube there just to prevent that from being crushed so it's just it's just a press fit so you can see that there uh, it's got a like a flange on this end here and I can rest that on the body of the chuck and what I need to do is to align this square edge with the with the mill with the y-axis of the mill now all I'm doing here is using a, a big square and I'm just taking that off the back of the column and you know you're probably saying well we should sweep that with an indicator but this edge that I'm squaring to is just cut with a hacksaw so it's not particularly accurate this is just a like a guide and I'll check that again when the camera's out of the way but I think I'm pretty close there and we're going to drill the holes with a three millimeter carbide end mill and that's just because uh, if a, a normal drill bit hits that curved surface it'll just skid off to the side and I'm just using the NC code to position the spindle and I'm using the quill to bring the carbide end mill down and go through the material. So I'm just doing this in single block mode. So that's our first hole position. So we got holes equally spaced around that copper dome now. I think that went out of focus, so I'll do the other one. <laughs> and uh, then we're going to turn this flange and make it circular. Oh, 
Well, there's a pattern of holes, and I'm going to leave that piece of aluminium in there so that when I put it on the lathe now to machine this flange fully circular, we won't crush the copper pipe. I'll deburr that, but the next bit's the hard bit. Okay, this is today's job. Um, I've got to be able to drill two holes here, diametrically opposed, and they have to line up precisely with the features that are already done. So I remember I already have these drilled holes in the bottom flange, and that bottom flange is aligned in a particular way. And I want these drilled holes, and these are going to take some uh, fittings. They have to line up with that already drilled hole and the curvature of that base. So this is sort of what I've got, and when you look at this you say, no, Mark's lost his mind <laughs> at last, but it's surprisingly difficult to set this up. So I'll show you what I've got. So this is a 3D printed fixture. It's printed in PLA, but it's 85% filled, so it's quite dense and quite rigid. It's got the boss on here, which fits inside the copper tube, and it's got the radius on here which matches the, the radius on the, the wooden frame that I've already built. Plus it's got a couple of notches that help me to align the previously drilled holes. So that goes on there like that and you can sort of look through that top drilled hole and align it with the scribe mark that I've already put on there. So that gets the part mounted on the fixture correctly. Then the fixture goes in the vise and I've just got a bit of uh, aluminium wire here so that the part is pushed back against the rear jaw and it's not influenced by the moving jaw. And then I've already offset from the end of the copper tube 10 millimeters and now I need to find the exact center of that copper tube and that's where we're going to drill our hole. Now I'm going to have to flip this part over, do the other side and then I'm going to swap out for this other one here. So I'll set up a vice stop so that I don't lose that position each time I move the part. So you're probably asking about this one, what happened to this one here? Well, it's not right. I drilled this one using a different method and I wasn't happy with it. This hole is offset toward one side about a millimetre and a half. And for me, that's, that means that's scrap. But I can, uh, I've used this one as a sort of a test uh, to check out how easy it is to braze these joints. And I can use this as a drilling jig. I'm gonna cut the top off. I'll use that part as a drilling jig to locate my holes in the wooden frame. So we'll put that one aside. Let me get this one set up and we'll come back when we drill the holes. So there's the setup. Uh, I've got the vice stop in place so I can just uh, swap out these parts and swap sides. I've moved the drill bit to the center of that V in the fixture Check that, it's fine, but that's not how I set this. I actually put the center finder on the, both edges of the copper tube, use the half function to find back here, but I just wanted to verify that I got that right. So we can move back in our Y. That's it there. So I'm going to spot drill that now and I'll gradually open it up with bigger drill bits. But remember this copper is annealed and it's going to deform if we put a big drill bit in there and plunge that in. 
So I'm just going to gradually open it up. Alright, pretty sure we're good there now. So there's our through hole and it lines up exactly with our drill holes in the base and exactly with the curvature of the saddle. And next step is to get the cap on, get the, the actual flange on the top and then the lid. This is going to be the cap on top of the steam dome and it's made of two pieces of brass sheet uh, and they're going to be silver soldered together. Now the only reason I'm using two pieces is that I've got lots of this two millimeter thick brass sheet. I don't have anything thicker. And to get the look that I want, uh, we're just gonna have to laminate those together. So we're just gonna silver solder this and it doesn't need to be a particularly strong joint. So I'm just gonna put the flux on the outside. It's all clean on the inside. And we're just gonna get some of that silver solder to flow around the edge of the joint. Now this, will, uh, this part will be drilled through later on and we're going to fit a light sensor through that hole there or at least the wires for the light sensor. That's just about the limit of my propane torch. <laughs> Takes a while to get that hot. Yeah, I wish I had oxyacetylene. You can see how that silver solder is run all around the edge there. I'm going to get this part cleaned up in the acid pickle and uh, we're going to drill the holes around the circumference, but I won't show you that. That's the same process I've used before on the CNC mill. And then that part has to be drilled out and threaded for the light sensor. I've got to join this ring uh, which will form the top plate or the mounting for the top plate and it's got to go onto that piece of copper tube there and I've got to align the pattern of six holes here with a pattern underneath and you may not be able to see it but I've got a scribed mark there which I'm using to align with one of those holes and here's one set up here uh, I'm going to have to heat this from underneath and then put a couple of pieces of silver solder on the inside and try and get that solder to flow. And there are two bushes that need to go on the, or in those two holes that I drilled in the copper tube already. And I think I'm gonna soft solder those. Uh, the issue is that I'm sort of running out of capacity with propane to get this hot enough. And the other thing is that um, there's a chance uh, that you can undo some of the silver solder joints. It, it apparently is not common. Uh, once you've actually formed the silver solder joint, it actually alloys with the brass and the copper and makes it a higher melting point than the silver solder that you're putting in. But honestly, don't want to run the risk. So I'm going to drop a couple of pieces of silver solder inside there and we can just soft solder those little bushes in later.
Uh, real time, that took about three or four minutes to get that up to temperature and the silver solder has flowed right around the inside there, so I'm happy with that. Uh, so we'll get the other one done and then we'll make up the little bushes and get them in and then we can make some studs and put the cap on and we're done. Final step in fabricating this dome structure is to fit a brass bush on either side or a brass coupling I suppose on either side of the dome and these take a coupling nut. Now you can buy these from model engineer suppliers and they take a 3 16th diameter piece of copper tubing and there's a special tail that gets silver soldered onto the copper tube and that's clamped by the nut on the end of that bush there or coupling. I'm going to fit these with soft solder mainly because uh, it doesn't need to be terribly strong and every time you subject this structure to a heat cycle, get it up to red heat, you've got to clean it again and it's just, it, it, it's not good for the material. So I've got one here set up on a piece of fire brick and I've held the, the two brass couplings in place with a nut and bolt all the way through and that keeps it tight in place and it won't fall off when I'm trying to work on it. And I'm going to put the solder on the inside so that it doesn't sort of run all over the place. So what I've done is I've got some ordinary 60-40 uh, soft solder and with a pair of side cutters you can clip off some small pieces. So you just simply chop a little bit off like that and keep it in a container. And you want to put the, the bare minimum amount of solder on this because it tends to run all over the place and I don't really want it on the outside of the assembly when it's done. So uh, I'm going to put some acid flux on here uh, I've already got a piece of solder in a pair of tweezers and when this is hot enough I'll just simply place that on the inside there. So let me get you in a bit closer and we'll try that out. So again cleanliness is everything with this. You've got to make sure the metal is clean and you've got to try and keep it clean during the heating process. So this uh, flux is a hydrochloric acid mix and put that on before you even heat it and that has the effect of actually taking some of the oxide off the material and then as you heat it that uh, flux will actually uh, the moisture and it will boil off and it will leave behind the salts and they help protect the copper as well or the brass. So we're going to bring this up to temperature. I'm using quite a small flame. It's that quick, a <laughs> lot better than silver soldering. So I'll flip that over, do the other one while it's still hot. Because that's hot, as soon as that acid flux hits that, it uh, removes any oxide that's already on there. I'm just using a cotton swab to get it on here. Well, I'm just going to rinse that off and we'll have a look. So you can see it's slightly discoloured, a uh, little bit of that solder has flashed around the joint on the outside there but that'll clean off okay with a bit of steel wool and a wire brush. And we can take that nut and bolt out of there. And that's done, so I'll get that cleaned up and we'll do the final assembly now. Off camera I put a 3mm thread in each one of these holes here. And with the cap that goes on this, I've already drilled it out and deburred it and it's all ready to go. So let me get this cleaned up and then we'll have a look at the whole thing assembled. I showed you these T-fittings partly finished a while ago and what I need to do now is make a final assembly out of these parts by silver soldering the brass flanges onto either the ends of the T's or the top of this copper tube here. 
and it's a bit of a fiddle because everything's really loose and I want to be able to clock the holes around the the face of each one of those brass rings so they closely align. <laughs> I figured it wasn't worth going to a lot of trouble with this. It is just decorative and there's no real downside to getting them slightly out apart from just the fact that they might look a bit iffy. So uh, in order to make sure that these don't accidentally rotate while I'm getting it silver soldered together I'm using a technique where I just nip the end of the copper T to raise a burr and then when you put the ring on there you can sort of uh, hold it in place so once again just get the the jaws of the side cutters and just nip that copper tube and bend it outwards just slightly and then when you press the the ring on there you can sort of swivel it round to where you want it to be so I might have overdone that one. <laughs> Where do I get a hammer? All right, there it goes. So um, what I'll do now is just simply align this. I'm going to put um, the holes aligned this way so I don't have one right at the very bottom opposite this section of the T here. So let me get all of those done and I'll show you what it looks like and then we'll solder solder that together. Well that's fully assembled now ready for the solder and I don't know if you can see that but I've clocked those holes on the ends and uh, it doesn't need to be you know super precise it's just for appearances. And I did the same thing with this copper tube here I just nipped the end of that press it up into the T and this flange is already fairly tight on that tube but I can work on that now without any worry about it falling apart so I'll get this all coated with flux and then we'll get it hot and we'll do the joints with this one okay this one's ready to go uh, so the important thing here is to keep the heat contained around the part that's why I've got this resting on fire brick and I've tried to pack it with as much fire brick as I can and still get at it and I mentioned this, uh, this stuff here is being SBA45 that stands for silver brazing alloy and yes it is 45 percent real silver and that's why it's so expensive but the good thing is that it flows very readily and uh, the only important thing especially for me is keeping your hand steady while you feed this stuff in I, I don't have steady hands so that's why it wiggles all over the place but what you want to avoid is having the solder smear and run in places where you don't want it and part of the trick also is to use the heat of the part to melt the brazing alloy and not the flame. So if you put this into the, the flame, it'll just simply droop and, and you know, form a puddle on the part. But if you can feed the solder into the red hot joint and then just leave it there long enough, it will flow. I'll try and demonstrate that as we go. So I'm not sure if you saw what I was doing there, but I was just flicking the flame away and then getting the solder into the joint and then just bringing the flame back momentarily just to raise the heat enough to get the solder to flow. And I'm trying to get the bare minimum amount of solder on this because it's a different color to the copper, a different color to the brass, so I don't really want it to be in other places other than the joint. Anyway, I'll get this one pickled and uh, we'll have a look at it cleaned up. Well, there are the parts after pickling and washing, rubbing the steel wool. And what I need to do now is join the arms onto those fittings. Now, I'm going to do this with soft solder and I'll do it off camera. It's a pretty straightforward process. So I'm just going to stand them up and run a bit of soft solder around here. Once again, these don't need to be silver soldered. 
and I don't really want to get this hot and black and horrible again. So I'll do that off camera, I might show you a quick snippet, but um, we'll get that done and then the connecting pipe that goes on this end of the flange is just going to be loose, won't worry about soldering that in. And uh, I did these joints uh, off site. Now these are big chunky bits of brass and I don't have enough uh, capacity with my propane to be able to get that red hot, at least I don't think so anyway. So I took these to another site and I used some oxyacetylene to run some silver salt around those. And it's quick, it's easy, uh, less chance of things going wrong if you can use oxyacetylene. So they're done and polished. So let me get this put together and then we'll have a look at the whole clock to this point anyway, assembled and we'll get a sense of how it's going to look. Before we wind up today I thought you should have a look at where we're at with the build. And I've got both these clocks now sitting on their bases. And although it's possible to tilt that and have the display facing upwards, I think in reality it's going to have to be positioned so the screen is dead vertical. And that way this thing is sitting on top of the frame and not canted backwards. Now I'll show you in a minute how I got this in position. But you're probably looking at this and saying, gee Mark, how did you get those wood screws underneath these bushes here? Well, the reality is I cheated. <laughs> I know, it's sad, isn't it? But I realized that I had these screws in the wrong place. I should have positioned them 30 degrees off that center so they were get atable, if that's a word. And what I've done is I just soft soldered those two screws in position underneath that flange there and I've drilled these holes out oversize. So they're just going to plonk down like that and the other four screws will hold it on. Uh, it's one of those things that you overlook when you're doing a prototype and if I was doing it again of course I'd reposition those holes differently. So let's have a look at um, the assembly of this part on the other clock. So this is what I've got, I'll just pivot that round so you can see it a bit better. But the centre of that assembly has to be 102 millimetres from this end of the wooden frame and I've marked that 102 mark there and then I've offset either side of that half the diameter of the flanged base and that's where it needs to go within that range there. But the thing is uh, we want to be sure that it's directly on top of the cylindrical body here and to do that I put a bit of masking tape down here and I've marked off the joint lines. Now I can see them quite clearly there are joints in the wood frame here and they are positioned dead centre in the middle of that cylinder. So if I can find halfway between those two pencil lines, I've also got the halfway or what would you call it, like the 12 o'clock position on the top of that cylinder there. So I'll take that tape off and we'll flatten it out and we'll find the exact center. So I'll take that tape off and I'm just going to stick it down temporarily to this piece of sheet metal. So it's straight and flat and then we'll find that halfway point. So I'm getting about 61 millimeters, so 30.5 is there. So that's our center. And then we can put that back in two different points. So I'm just going to put that back where it was and match up the pencil lines with the joints in the wood frame. Mark that center off there. And then move along a bit and do the same again. And then of course you can join those two pencil marks together. So masking tape is really useful for doing this sort of thing. You can use it to divide the circumference of a cylindrical part like that into equal numbers of divisions within you know, a reasonable degree of accuracy. So now I've got my center there. I've got the extremities of where the flange will go and I know that I'm pretty much dead center on that cylindrical surface there. Now, you may remember that I made one of these, uh, these steam domes and I messed it up, but I said I would keep this one as a template. Well, this is what it's for. So what we can do now is place that one on top there and just look through the holes in the drilled base and they're, they're accurate, they're correct. And I put it between the two pencil marks there and I can now mark off my six divisions and drill those holes. So these are my six positions here. 
These two right on the top here are going to be drilled out a clearance size for the wood screws. These ones are going to be drilled out uh, so that the wood screws will drive into those holes. Alrighty, let me, I'm going to get the camera out of the way so I can see what I'm doing here. And uh, I'll get the holes drilled and uh, we'll put that one in place and I'll show you how to finish off the top. And there's our six holes drilled down and these end ones are going to be clearance size for the screws. So I'll just push in there. The other two uh, on each side will hold the dome down. So uh, that's going to go in place there. Oh, and this central hole here is for a couple of wires that need to come up from inside the clock. Now we're going to be mounting a device on top of this, which I'm calling the Cyclops Eye. <laughs> it's actually a light sensor and it sets the clock to night mode. Uh, but it's going to be a, a funky little uh, fitting that goes up on top there. I didn't actually show that in the original drawing. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to fit it to the clock. And on the other clocks that I've made, it's been a sort of a hidden feature that you don't see. But for this one, I reckon we can make it a, uh, a nice decorative feature. It's going to look really cool. All right, so those wood screws, we'll just simply hold that down like that. And then we've got to fit some studs to the top of the, the dome itself. Okay, I won't bother putting all those in now, but it's all going to have to come apart <coughs> many, many times. So the, uh, the studs I've already got made up. Now these are three millimeter diameter studs or M3 threads with an M3 hex nut on it. I know it's not very traditional, but it's all I've got. And with a stud driver, it's, uh, it's got a threaded hole in the end just of a piece of steel rod. And you can uh, thread the stud into that and then put the lock nut on and tighten up the lock nut. Then you can drive the stud into any of those holes there. And I've tapped these uh, just lightly. So with the taper tap, I didn't tap all the way through. So the stud should get tight as it's just reaching the back side of that flange there. And then you just loosen the hex nut and you can undo the stud driver. And the stud should stay in there. So I'm going to get all six of those done and it's going to wind up looking like this one. And of course the, uh, that little decorative feature I was talking about is going to thread into that uh, 7 16 diameter hole and allow the wires to pass up through the top of the dome. Well sadly I think we've come to the end of our half hour slot for today. So I'm going to wind up this episode but invite you to come back for the next one. We're going to be making some really really cool parts to go on this steam dome. And uh, thanks for watching, thanks for sending in comments, and speaking of comments, if anybody knows the name of the dude that I'm wearing today and where I might have purchased this t-shirt, put it in the comments. You'll be showing off your cultural side if you know. And uh, just a hint, it's not an engineer. <laughs> so it's Prezzo signing out for now, and uh, catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.